Let's take our Bibles tonight. Let's open up to the Revelation chapter 2. And tonight we are going to start out looking at our very first of the seven churches as the church of Ephesus. I am very, very glad that that is the first church that we look at. Uh, when we see the things that are going on in Ephesus, uh, it's, it's just so practical, the things that we will see here tonight. So uh, let's begin, if we could, this evening in the first verse of chapter 2. The Bible says, Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst, bear, canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say that they were apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars." And has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and hath not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. For else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Over the next seven weeks, we are going to look at the exact same outline, the exact same major points. All five churches, or all seven churches, are going to have these five major things going on. So the very first thing we look at, and every time that we look at these churches, Roman numeral number one is the culture. We're going to be looking at the culture, and this is going to take just a bit, but we cannot fully appreciate uh, the rest of the points tonight without really understanding what's going on in the culture. Letter A, there are four people who were involved in the founding of this church. The Apostle Paul, which isn't any surprise to us. But then there is Aquila, and there is Priscilla, and the fourth name is going to be Apollos. So you have Paul, Aquila, Priscilla, and Apollos. Keep a marker here, if you will, in Revelation 2 or yeah, Revelation 2, go back with me to the book of Acts chapter 18, and let's find the very first time that the church of Ephesus is ever mentioned in the Scriptures. And in Acts chapter 18, we see the beginnings and how this all came about. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 18, verse 1, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. Jump to verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Shentria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard him, they took him, took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. And for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Let's not miss something here in this chapter. As this church is started by Paul, Aquila, Priscilla, and Apollos, the question is, how did Aquila and Priscilla get to Ephesus? You look at the Scripture, the very first passages that we read, the Bible says that they were from Italy. They were from Rome, Italy. How did they end up, first of all, in Corinth? And the Bible tells us that they were pushed there because of persecution. So they were going through troubles at home. Claudius had deported anybody that called themselves a Christian. And so off they go, and they end up in Corinth, 615 miles southeast from home. When the Apostle Paul comes through Corinth, and he's getting ready to head to Ephesus, he wants to take some workers with him. And here's Aquila and Priscilla. And he says, come on, let's go. And off they go, and they go to Ephesus. Now they have gone another 640 miles farther straight east. 
And in total, they are now 1,265 miles from home. God has taken them that far away from their home for what purpose? To get a church started in the city of Ephesus. You know, you think about the things that we go through in life, and tonight you may be going through something or you've gone through something, and it's been one of those things that's driven you from your comfort zone, your home plate, if you will. Remember when uh, Abram was called from the Ur of the Chaldees, and he was sent from Ur over here in Babylon all the way over to the Canaan land, so he had to go some 700 miles from home. There are some folks that will say, this has been my home, it's always my home, and I'll never go anyplace else. Oh, don't tell God that. Don't tell God that, because you know exactly what's going to happen, don't you? You're going to be taking a road trip somewhere. We have got to be willing to go wherever God has called us. And as I said in Sunday morning's message, home is wherever God plants you. Home is not where you were born. You say, well, that's easy for you to say. You're right back here. Well, yeah, but I haven't always been. You know, I had the years that I was in college. We were up in, in a foreign nation in Michigan for three years so we were on the mission field and everything else before we came back here. We were not looking to come back home. It wasn't that we were pining for home. It's just how God worked it out. Okay, fine. But God could have taken us someplace else entirely. You've got to be willing to go wherever God wants you to go. And here's people, they were pushed out of their homeland by persecution. They could have been mopey in Corinth and going, oh, there's nothing here that looks like home, boo-hoo-hoo. They could have been pushed to Ephesus. Oh, this isn't home either. I miss this. I miss that. Well, what good would that do you? It's going to make you miserable where you're at, right? Instead, you figure out, why does God have me here? What does God have for me to do? What did God have for them to do? Start a church. Ephesus needed a church, and now they got one. All right, let's talk some more about this town. Letter B. A dual government was in place, Greece and Rome. And, and that's kind of an interesting uh, way to do things. Remember in Jerusalem, it was the, the Jews in Rome, and they've got the dual government there. Here it's Greece and Rome. You can imagine the problems that that's going to cause when you have two governments that are saying that they're in charge. You've got the homeland government, and you've got the foreign government that's come in and taken over. Let her see the city was pagan. The city was pagan. The Greek goddess, number one, Artemis, and the Roman equivalent, Diana, were the main gods worshipped. So very, very pagan culture. Number two, there were at least 14 pagan temples for the worship of Artemis, Diana, and a host of lesser gods, all in this one city. Over 14 temples. When Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla come to Ephesus, Paul left them there, and he traveled more throughout Asia. When he returns, he ends up walking right into a pagan's hornet's nest. Look in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, starting in verse 23. And the Bible says, The same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all of Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger, to be said at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Jump to verse 34. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Can you just hear this? I mean, this is a scary, pagan, cultish chant. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they say this for two hours solid. That's what Paul's in the middle of. That's what this church is in the middle of. 
the church of Ephesus is in the middle of this kind of a mess. Number three, the emperors were considered divine and they were worshipped as God. Domitian proclaimed himself to be Lord and God. The brother and uh, dad of Domitian, they were the ones responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And now here's Domitian who believes he's a god. Number four, sexual immorality ran rampant due to the fact of there being temple prostitution. It was not unusual for the temple worship of Diana or Artemis to end up in a massive orgy. And then they would uh, give some offerings and things like that, and we'll see how that plays into the rest of their beliefs in a minute. But then they would go right back to the prostitution again. In the midst of this, number five, Ephesus is the intellectual center of this region, very cosmopolitan, high-cultured, and a wealthy travel hub between continents. Isn't that amazing? As pagan and wrapped up in superstition as this place is, they are still the, one of the most intellectual places you could have ever visited in this time period. They were a commercial port where various paths going to Rome would converge at Ephesus before making the journey to Rome. Number six, occultic activity was very prevalent. Occultic activity. Now, why is that something that we need to know? Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. We looked at this verse on Sunday, and I told you we were going to look at it a little bit differently uh, tonight. Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, what do we have here? What's going to be the main thing we're going to go look at? You know. What are we supposed to put on? The whole armor of God. Why? Because we have heard it for years. We are in a spiritual fight. We're in a spiritual battle. Is that true? Sure it is. But this was something that was spoken initially to the church of Ephesus. And notice verses 10 and 11, or excuse me, 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are fighting against the occult. We are fighting against Satan. We are fighting against the demons. That's true for us, right? I mean, our battlefield's in the same place, but this was spoken to Ephesus. And as they read these words, I just kind of picture them looking around I was like, yep, yeah, we are. We are in the middle of an occultic realm. When I was pastoring uh, the chapel uh, for Tennessee Temple University, I was pastoring one of the pa uh, chapels I pastored was Chickamauga Baptist Church. It was in the Chickamauga battlefield. And it literally, you'd turn off to go into the battlefield, and there was this big, huge stone church building. We hadn't gone in very deep. And that was the second church that I had there. And as we went into that church for the first time, it had been closed down for a while. And we took a group in and we started doing cleaning. And we had a long single story wing where the Sunday school classrooms and then there was like a fellowship hall was at. And so we started going into those rooms, looking them over. And in several of those classrooms, you could tell somebody had broken in and there were pentagrams drawn all over the place. And you could see spots where candles had been lit on the floor. And I am a young pastor. Uh, boy, I am so stinking wet behind the ears, I don't know anything. And we had went out, my wife and I, the way we heated this building, we went out, we had to heat it with kerosene heaters. And we went out one night, uh, we would go out on Saturday night, start the kerosene heaters, and then it'd be all nice and toasty for church on Sunday. And we both went out there, and it was kind of dark out. And I'm not somebody, and neither is my wife, people that get all freaked out and weirded out by stuff. But I tell you what, we got out there, and we felt something. I don't even know how to explain it. We felt something. And I got those things lit, and I got in my car, and I looked at her, and I says, are you okay? She says, let's get out of here. And I says, why? She says, do you feel that? And I says, yep. We could not get out of there fast enough. You could feel such an occultic oppression in that place. I mean, it just weighed. It, to me, I can't imagine the people. I, it bumfuzzles me why anybody would ever want to go to something like Mardi Gras. 
or to go down into those places of New Orleans where, where the occult, where voodooism and stuff like that is so rampant. I, I don't even understand the curiosity. Why anybody would even be curious? Oh, I just want to see it. Why? Why? I want to avoid it. I want to get away from it as far as I possibly can. Come to find out where our church was at. We didn't know this at the time. Chickamauga Battlefield, uh, for that area of Georgia, was one of the, the central hubs for occultic activity. And out in the battlefield, they would go out and they would do animal sacrifices with their pentagrams and all their other stuff they would bring out there. And here we are having a church out there. Oi, that's, that was an experience, I'll tell you that. Number seven, there was the Agora. The Agora is the commercial center of the city, reminiscent of a high-end flea market or an outdoor shopping mall. The Agora. Dr. Joe Stoll, he is the former president of Moody um, Bible Institute. Uh, he is now the president of Cornerstone University in Grand Rapids. Uh, he writes devotionals for our daily bread. He says of the Agora, he says not only was the Agora the place to buy and sell, it was also a place where society met and fellowshiped. It was the social hub. To enter the Agora, there was a container of incense near the incense burner. You would have to take a pinch of incense and drop some in the burner, acknowledging your loyalty and your worship of the emperor. If you would not put some incense in the incense burner, that meant that you are not in allegiance with the emperor who claims to be Lord and God. Therefore, you're not coming into the Agora. So these Christians, they have a newly formed church in this city, and now they have to figure out, how do we shop? How do we buy and sell? How do we survive? How do we get the things that we need? Not only that, but the Agora was also the social hub. And so now the Christians are not only cut off from the supplies they need, they are also cut off from society. They're cut off from people. So it becomes a very lonely existence there in Ephesus. As you consider that, imagine being a new Christian in a city like Ephesus. And imagine having a brand new church in a city like Ephesus. Imagine what that would be like. Let's return back to Revelation chapter 2, and I tell you, this is why the commendation is Roman numeral number 2 in your outline, the commendation. We have got to understand the culture to appreciate what we see the rest of the way here. The commendation, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, thou hast tried them which say that they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Verse 6, the, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So in your outline, letter A, the church was commended, first of all, for their work. For their work. And this is a phrase that is used repeatedly, not just their work, but the Bible also says their labor. Work is the expenditure of energy. So anytime that you do any kind of work, you're going to expend energy, right? But it talks about their labor. What does that word mean? The word labor is the word in the Greek that is directly connected to labor pains. Labor pains. Ladies, you know what we're talking about here, right? Guys, anybody had a kidney stone? Okay, you're getting closer to understanding. Uh, the labor pains. You understand what the pains are that are involved in doing the work of the Lord. Christians, working and serving the Lord is not just kind of wind us up and away we go and no problems to it. There is labor involved in it. There is going to be pain that's involved in it. Turning back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 tonight. This is a great compliment that's been leveled to the church at Ephesus, but also a great compliment that's going to be leveled uh, at the church of Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 2 and 3, we give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and of our Father. So they are commended for their work. This is a working church. Now, uh, letter B, their tenacity. The word patience that we have in verse 2 is a word that means endurance. Quitters are a dime a dozen. This is a church that's full of people with stick -to 
Now, how hard would it have been to be a stick to Christian in Ephesus? And how much easier would it have been to be a quitter? And I don't mean quitting being a Christian, but I mean, okay, let's quit the church. There's gonna, I, Lord knows my heart. Lord knows I've accepted him. Let's put a little pinch of incense in there. It means nothing to me. It makes the emperor happy. I got to shop. How easy would that have been? But these people had tenacity. Let her see. Their stand. Their stand. The Nicolaitans, the Bible says they hate the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans taught that the body was insignificant. Therefore, you can do anything you wanted to with your body because it doesn't matter. Your body doesn't matter. That's why you could justify the temple prostitutes. You could go in, you could do your thing with the prostitutes, you go make your offering, now our body is cleansed again, we can go do it all over again so we can just keep those offerings aflowing. Because that's what the Nicolaitans taught. Your body doesn't matter. And that is incredibly wrong theology. In 1 Corinthians 6.18, the Bible talks about how the sins of adultery are sins that are against the body. It's against the body. And the body is supposed to be kept in an honorable way. We know that sex is only acceptable within the realms of marriage. That is the only place that that it's acceptable. And that God says that the marriage bed is undefiled, and it's a place that is honorable, and it's a place that is blessed. Otherwise, no. Letter D, their discernment. Their discernment. The Bible says that they have tried them which say that they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. Their their discernment. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 tells us to don't not to believe the spirits, but to try the spirits. If that is true back here in Bible days, how much more true is it today? There are so many people out there. It used to be a time where you could go into a Christian bookstore and you saw who the publisher was on that book. And you knew exactly where that book was going to be, what the stand was, that you could trust it or you needed to discard it. There was a day where that was true of Baker Books. Baker Books, they were the publisher of of really good academic study tools for, for pastors, Sunday school teachers, evangelists, missionaries, anybody that really wanted to get into the depths of the word. Kriegel was another one. You could just trust them. Thomas Nelson was a trustworthy uh, publisher at one time. You know who you can trust now as far as a publisher goes? None of them. Because they will publish anything that makes money. And Thomas Nelson is probably one of the biggest right now that is pumping out the heresy of various authors that are just writing stuff that the Christians are buying their books. They're, and, and ladies, ladies, this is happening more towards you and for you. Devotional books that are written for the ladies that are they sound so super duper spiritual and all this kind of stuff, and they are so full of blasphemous heresy. But it's just kind of wiggled in there in a nice, super slick way. These people are slick. Try the spirits. Know that it's of the Lord. How do you know if it's of the Lord? Because it'll line up with the book. And if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's not of the Lord. So you always go back to the Scripture. Roman numeral number three, the correction. The correction that was given to this church. And this is probably the, one of the most familiar things we ever remember about this church. The correction is found in verse four. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. What does that mean? Your first love. I mean, think about what this church is doing. But your first love is not the church. Your first love is not the work of the church. Your first love is not your particular ministry. It's not your discerning spirit. It's not taking a stand. That's not your first love. Your first love has to be the Lord. And everything that we do has to come out of our love for the Lord, not waiting for it, our love for the Lord to catch up. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This... um, honestly has been a very, very convicting passage to me. As I look at the church of Corinth, what was this church doing that was wrong? And the answer is nothing. They weren't doing anything that was wrong. 
They were commended for the things that they were doing, and the things they were doing were 100% right. And this is something, Christian, and I think this is something that we, right here locally, because I believe the commendations that are given towards that church of Ephesus are commendations that the Lord could speak to our church right here. I really believe that because we are a working church and we are a committed church and we are dedicated and all these kinds of good things that were said about Ephesus. But I hope and pray that the correction that was leveled against Ephesus is not a correction that would be, have to be leveled here because you can do all the right things and not do it for the right reason. And the right reason is because I love the Lord. 1 Corinthians 13. Let these verses sink in. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understandeth all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, what's your next three words? I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. I am nothing, and it did me no good. Oh, but I, we, we evangelized. We did this. We did this. We did this. But did you do it because you loved the Lord or because it was your duty, because it was your obligation, because it was something that you had to check off of your list, because somebody else had kind of made you feel guilty, like, well, I guess maybe, yeah, I guess we ought to do that. And so we got all busy, busy, busy. Anyway, it was good busy things. It was right busy things. But we didn't do it because we loved the Lord. Prophet is nothing. And we are nothing. I don't say this in a prideful way. I don't mean it that way. But don't you want what you did for the Lord? Don't you want to be something? And don't you want to profit you something? If the Bible says if we're doing these things without love... We are nothing, and it profits us nothing. Then the other side of the coin says, if I do it for the right reasons and with the love for the Lord that is first and foremost, then I am something, and it does profit me. And I would think we would want to say that about our, be able to say that about ourselves, be able to say that about our church. Ephesus. I look at Ephesus, and boy, I would put Ephesus on the pedestal. I would say, folks, you want to go to a great church? You want to see a church that's on fire? You want to see a church that's doing something? You want to see a church that's filling their pews? You want to see a church that, I mean, they aren't lazy there? Boy, that's a working church. Go to Ephesus. But God says, but you're nothing. And it profits you nothing. Because you left your first love. That's convicting. And i got to tell you, ever since I had this message going, I started really thinking about every little stinking thing. I mean, hyper-analyzing every little thing I was doing. And it's like, Lord, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why did I do that, Lord? Am I doing this because I love you or because I feel like I have to? Why am I doing this? And you start really doing an awful lot of praying. And it's like, Lord, I want my heart to be right. I don't want to just do stuff. I don't want to just be a busy Christian. And I know that's, that sounds tantamount to blasphemy, doesn't it? Well, we need busy Christians. Not without love, we don't. Not without love. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 10 and verse 27, and he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. This church was told in their correction. Go back and do the first things. Go back and do the first works. What are the first works? When you first trusted Christ as Savior, can you remember back then? What did you do to be close to the Lord? What did you do? Probably couldn't pry you out of your Bible. Probably couldn't get you to quit talking about Him. Uh, you were, yeah, man, you'd pass out tracks. You just, oh, first thing in the morning, oh, Lord, I, I can, I'm so glad I got to wake up this morning, Lord, because it's another day that I can be in your word, and I can pray, and I can talk to you. And, ah, da, 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 da. and you were just hyper goofy in a good way. 
And then you got a little older in the Lord. And it started to fizzle. You know what, Baptists, dear Baptists, we've allowed the charismatics to take every ounce of emotion out of a Baptist church. We have allowed them to suck us dry. What in the world is wrong with us? I don't know about you, but love is not just an action. It's not just a deed. And it's not just words. But it's also something you feel very emotionally about. You ask any bride and groom staying at an altar, sharing their vows and all that kind of stuff, do you feel anything? Eh. <laughs> Somebody's going to get laid out at the altar for saying that. Yeah. Was this a good day for you? Yeah, it was okay. Yeah, it was all right. No. Oh, man, they're just, they're floating up here. There's an emotion there. Church, there is nothing wrong with us having emotion. Amen? Well, then we need to find some. But I'll tell you what, you really start falling in love with the Lord, you'll find it. You'll find it. It'll be written all over you. You'll be able to see that love. You'll be able to see it coming out as you, as you do. The Lord did not, by the way, church, the Lord didn't tell them, stop doing the things you're doing. He says, get back to your first love. That's the correction. The consequences. The last part of verse 5 of Revelation chapter 2. If you don't want to do that, well, here's the consequences, church. In verse 5, he says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, repent, do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Repent, or your light is going to be removed. Repent, or you will lose the light of effectiveness. Even though you keep doing all the right things without love, you're not going to be effective. Uh, West Coast Baptist College did, uh, Emily, were you there when they did their Love Works project? They did this thing called Love Works, and everybody had shirts that said the Love Works, had the Love Works logo on it. And they went out in the community and just did work projects for people. And I, did, I don't know how they went about doing evangelism with it, but I do know that that was interconnected with it. Uh, but they also, you know, they showed the love and the work that they would do for people. They didn't go out to do it for pay. They didn't go out to do it for praise. They went out because love works. You know, Christians, when we have a love in our hearts like we ought to have, we're not going to have any problem doing a work for the Lord. And we will be effective. But if we lose our effectiveness, it's not going to be because we weren't doing enough. It'll be because we weren't loving enough. That's when we'll lose our effectiveness. We can do all the right things and it amount to nothing. I want to do the right things and it amount to something. How about you? The way to do that is to learn what it is to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might. By the way, the gospel says that is the first and greatest commandment. So is there one sin greater than another? Well, if there is a first great commandment, then there's got to be a first great sin. And it would be not to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and all that strength and all that. But then it follows up and it says, and the second is like unto the first. What's the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God first, love neighbor second. Well, there's nothing in there about loving me. Well, every psychologist couch is telling me to love me more. I got to love me. God doesn't say anything about that. He says, you love me first, love your neighbor as yourself, and you won't have any problems. That's how we become effective. Roman number number five, the commitment. Verse 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We had all that culture information at the beginning. It plays an important part here. Remember, this is written to the church in Ephesus, a church that is in this culture that we talked about. Do you realize that Ephesus was the home of the first tree huggers? I think it really was. Said, what do you mean? Well... 
outside of the courtyard before you went into the temple of Diana or Artemis, before you went into that courtyard, there was a gigantic tree. It was believed, by the way, Diana uh, and and Artemis both, uh, the Greek god, the Roman equivalent, they were believed to be the goddesses of life and fertility. So if you wanted your crops to be good and fertile, better go worship in the temple of Diana or Artemis. If you wanted to have lots of kids, if you wanted to be fertile, better go into the into the temple. If you wanted to be prosperous in your business, prosperous in your life, better go into the temple. Before you went into the temple, here's this huge tree. And these people believed that this tree was blessed by the goddesses. And so before they even went into the temple, they would be there hugging the tree, believing that the tree was giving them life and fertility. And then they would go into worship. You say, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, but Pagan cultures, pagan gods, they do all sorts of weird things. But doesn't that make more sense now when the Lord says, you see this going on, but he says, he that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Remember the emperors? They believed themselves to be gods. In the emperor's courtyard, the emperor's courtyard was called their paradiso. And they were only, they would, the emperors would allow in just certain people. Commoners, you didn't go into the Paradiso. Christians, you definitely didn't go into the Paradiso. It was only by invitation of the emperor, and you had to be in his class of people. The Lord says, if you overcome, you'll come into my Paradiso. Isn't that great? The church of Ephesus, they see all this. These are things they understood because they're seeing it. And the Lord's saying, you know what? I've got a paradise that tops their paradise any day. i got a tree that's going to top their tree any day. You do what you're supposed to do. I'm going to take care of you. But love me first and foremost. Wow, what an awesome message to the church of Ephesus. And what an awesome message to us, church. This is something... This is something that needs to be replicated here. We need to look at our own life tonight. And I know as I look out, I I see the vast majority of you, you profess to be Christians, and, and you say that you know Jesus Christ as Savior, that is awesome, but do you really? And I'm not asking you to raise your hand, nod your head, nothing. you got to do some introspection before you answer this. Do you really love the Lord? with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength and body and everything you've got. Is that what drives you? Is that why you came to church tonight? No, I came to church because it's Wednesday. It's what we do. We're Baptists. We go to church on the middle of the week. And I don't want the pastor to see me on Sunday and say, hey, missed you Wednesday. So I came to church. Wrong reasons. Wrong reasons. Well, I didn't want to miss on the series. You know, we just started a couple times. I didn't want to miss anything. Wrong reason to be here. Well, I had to drop off something to a friend. Wrong reason to be here. Why are you here tonight? Why am I here tonight? Is it because we really love the Lord? It's like, Lord, I want to be where you want me to be, with who you want me to be, doing what you want me to be, because I love you. I just, I just, I'm here because I love you, Lord. Can we honestly say that from the depths of our heart? If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you can't say that at all. With words, yeah, you can say it, but they're they're meaningless words. They're as meaningless for a lost person to say that they love God. They're as meaningless as the works of a Christian who doesn't love the Lord, their God, with all their heart, soul, and mind. Lost soul, tonight you must be born again. Jesus Christ, He loved you. I mean, He loved you more than we can possibly Imagine, he loved you so much that he died on a cross for your sins. He loved you so much that he came to this earth and took on flesh and bone and our blood and our, you know, fashion like us. And then he goes to Calvary's cross. Before he ever got to the cross, though, the the illegal trials he went through, the beatings, the whippings, the scourging, the mocking, the uh, crown of thorns, the, the... slapped in the face and pulling his beard out and things like that, all the abuse that he took even before Calvary. But then for him to lay himself down on a cross and to have nails driven through his hands and his feet, 
when in one word he could have dropped every one of them dead. But he didn't. Because he knew what was necessary for you, for me. And he did it because he loved you. And he hung there on Calvary's cross. And as he bore our weight, the weight of our sins, our sins were so horrifically ugly on him that he has to cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Father, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. And he's buried in the tomb and he rises from the grave. And you know what? Still loves us. After all that, still loves us. And still extends salvation. Lost soul, it's a gift. It's a gift that you have to accept and receive personally yourself. It is not going to be thrust on you. So if God really loved me, he'd just save me and call it good. He's not going to force that on you. It's a gift. You must be born again. You say, well, how? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed tonight. If you're here without Jesus as your Savior, right now, would you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved? Would you pray something like this, Lord, I am a sinner. And I know I'm a sinner, and I know, Lord, that I don't deserve heaven. I deserve eternity in hell. But I believe, with all of my heart, Lord, I believe tonight that you love me so much. And I don't deserve it. But I, I believe you do love me, and I believe, Lord, you proved that love to me at Calvary. And I believe, Lord, that you rose again from the grave. And, and There's no other plan of salvation but yours, Lord, and tonight I repent and I believe the gospel. I call upon you, Lord, save my soul, please. Have you prayed something like that tonight? And I mean, you say, I've never prayed that before. I prayed it tonight and I meant that. If you have, would you just slip your hand up this evening? And our Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for loving us, for saving our soul. And now, Lord, may we find your love driving us in everything that we do, the way that we treat one another, the way that we conduct ourselves in business and in society, the way that we, the way that we do church. It's got to be done out of love for you. And Lord, if we don't love you as we should, convict us of that tonight, Lord. Burden our heart that we would just hunger for that intimate fellowship with you that we can enjoy. And we ask it all tonight, Lord, for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.